Um, let's begin with the Pledge of Okay, let's call the roll, please. President Cook. Here. Vice President Dom. Here. Treasurer Fritz. Here. Secretary uh, Thomas. Here. Trustee Avar. Here. Trustee Gayton. Yeah. Trustee Zimmerman. Present. Okay. We go to four point oh um, public comments. <laughs> we have some members of the public. I don't know if you wish to comment now or. There's usually a public comment later in the meeting also. Any public comments here in the audience or at home? I don't see any. All right. Then we'll go to uh, new business 5.1, the Lions Marsh, Lions Prairie and Marsh Conservation Area. And we're going to have a discussion about the Possible proposals that we've received. So um, I don't know if Ed wants to make a preliminary comment or Elizabeth. Yeah, I'll I, I begin and, and Gabe will do the bulk of the presentation. So, uh, and, and he'll do that in just a minute. And he'll be presenting background information on Lions Prairie, uh, the site in general, and the Lions Prairie Fox River Peninsula in particular. Especially as it, as it relates to the erosion issues along the Fox River. But before I turn that over to Gabe, I think it's important, especially if you're not familiar with clients, uh, to understand that portions of it are not located within the political boundary of McHenry County. There's a substantial portion of the site that's within Lake County, and that includes a section of the site that's the topic of tonight's discussion regarding the acceptance of request for proposals. But that would be important to give you a little bit of background of how McHenry County Conservation District came to own land in Lake County, Illinois. Uh, Lions was a very early purchase by the district in 1982. And at that time, what is now a very highly urbanized portion of McHenry County that surrounds that site was much more rural. Uh, and some of the basic governmental services for that area that is enclosed within that big bend of the Fox River actually originated on the McHenry County side at the time. So the district received a special permission from the state to purchase the Lake County inclusion of what today is the Hickory Grove, Lion Prairie Marsh Conservation Area with an eye towards preserving those areas along the river uh, as public open space in what was rapidly starting to grow in terms of that part of the county. So with that little bit of background on how we came to own land in Lake County, Illinois, I'm going to turn it over to Gabe and he'll provide you more information on the site and the natural resource issues and the three proposals that we received. Sure, right. there's a map you'll show us a little. Yeah. Maybe you can, yeah. Uh, good evening. My name is Gabe Powers, uh, the new trustee that I've not had the privilege to meet yet. Welcome. I look forward to advancing the mission of the district with you during your tenure. Tonight, we're discussing um, the feasibility study that uh, we had for. Receiving RFPs to address riparian erosion at Lions Prairie Marsh. And uh, what I'm going to do tonight is go through the RFPs, but also provide for the benefit of the board and the trustees some of the background that led us to this point in time. Uh, this picture right here that you see is actually the remnant uh, wetland at Lions Prairie, one of the primary purposes for preservation of uh, the site, uh, high quality remnant. And next slide. Right here, as Ed mentioned, is the county line. So west of uh, Lions Prairie and Marsh is where McHenry County is. This is Hickory Grove. In this area is Lions Prairie and Marsh. It's the McCary area. The uh, remnant wetland for which the site was preserved is located right about uh, in this area. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see the boundary of the Illinois Nature Preserve. And this was dedicated in 1982, uh, as mentioned, for the high quality remnant wetland, which is here. And then the areas that are to the north are considered buffer areas for the nature preserve. 
Um, the area that we are really talking about is where the main channel of the Fox River meets the land that you see uh, there. But the big thing to know is the high quality remnants are preserved by the buffer area. And we're talking about the buffer area of the nature preserve in the discussion today. <clears throat> so the area history, the water level uh, at Lions Prairie and Marsh is controlled by the Algonquin Dam. The original dam structure was constructed in 19, excuse me, 1854, and that was a mill dam. And in 1939, the state of Illinois acquired the mill dam and what is now the Office of Water Resources, I forget the name of the agency at that time, but that's who acquired the dam and removed the dam in 1946. And then the Algonquin Dam, as we know it, was constructed in 1947. An important part is the hinge press gate that was installed in 2002. And if you look at the lower picture, that's what the hinge press gate looks like from a downstream looking upstream perspective. And then this is Algonquin Dam proper looking kind of sideways downstream to upstream. What I want you to remember, these dates right here, um, 1946 is when the mill dam was removed. And 1947 is when the Algonquin Dam was constructed because we're gonna look at aerial photographs and also interpretations of land versus water uh, before and after that time. Next slide. The purpose of that hinge press gate, this is a cross-sectional view of that structure. There's an air bladder that will move the gate up and down if you want to have the gates higher, you put more air in the air bladder that'll lift the gate. If you want to lower it, reduce the air and uh, the gate and the water level will recede. The purpose of the crest gate in 2002 was for flood control and also pool navigation. The flood control general parameters are to lower the water during uh, winter conditions so that uh, you can have prepared conditions for the spring runoff um, to reduce some of that flood pulse to the area. The state uh, designates uh, 849 acres, their approximation of the recreational reservoir that is upstream of the Algonquin Dam and supported by um, the placement of the dam. The Fox Waterway Agency regulates no wake in the area. So if there's ever high water levels or other conditions that would create um, erosion or impacts to land adjacent to the reservoir, they could uh, have the authority to place that no wake Regulation. All right, so this is an important photo comparison right here. The one on the left is the 1939 air photo. And you can see right here, this is uh, old meander channel of the Fox River. At some point in time, the historic channel, uh, streams will migrate back and forth within their floodplain over time. And you can see uh, the aquatic feature here, it's uh, primarily heavy marsh. I want you to just kind of pay attention to the mental image of this area right here. See these lighter colors? Those are returns uh, on the photo of upstanding water. Even though there's land here, that is what I would just describe as an emergent well. So there's vegetation growing through that area, but it's inundated. There's, there's water in those places. And then you can see right here as well, there's water inundated. That's emergent wetland. And then heavy marsh through here, right there in heavy marsh. And then if you compare that to the current air photo on the right, 2021 is the picture from Google Earth. And um, you can see this is that old uh, meander channel and you can see the amount of open water. Um, what happens is when you inundate wetland vegetation, uh, the depth and duration, so the amount of water in the wetland vegetation and the duration of time, you can actually flood out that vegetation over time. And when that vegetation is flooded out, sediment migration is easier um, to move back and forth and take place through uh, forces, rivering forces, be it wave or flow action. So really what is happening there here is there's submersion based on that dam and then duration. As I had mentioned previously, the uh, current operations in that 2002 uh, crest gate installation was increasing the water level for the pool during the growing season of vegetation for recreational purposes. So we're actually having the water higher uh, for recreation and that's it's contributing to the loss of emergent vegetation in this area. 
Uh, these, this slide right here was from uh, a 2018 board presentation. I'll go through the history here in a little bit. But remember that 1939 uh, image right here, that yellow line is the best guess boundary of open water versus well. All right, so the, the, the change in between emergent vegetation to open water is very slim based on that depth and duration. But the big thing to notice is when that dam was installed in 1947, the 1954 is not that divergent from the 1939. You can see the divergence here. In 54, so we had more open water in this area. We had a little bit more open water in this area. But overall, that 39 and 54 are relatively similar open water to vegetated landscape. And again, that has to do with depth and duration. So it took quite a while for the submersion of the land at Lyons to eliminate the vegetation and transfer to a more of a deep water, uh, red herring marsh, open water situation. So the history of the district's contact on this issue of submersion and soil migration dates back to the late 90s. Uh, and at the point in time, the Fox Waterway Agency reached out to the Conservation District and uh, mentioned the possibility of soil erosion taking place in the area, right about that square downstream. And um, in 2003, the district replied to a letter to the director of operations at that point in time. This is before we had the land preservation division uh, responded to that letter. In 2011, staff met with the Fox Waterway Agency and came up with a plan uh, and cost estimate for doing some type of stabilization on this area. And the numbers that came back, it was determined that the cost benefit costs were too high for the benefits that would be received at that point in time. In 2018, uh, again, this is where this image came from. The Land Preservation Division provided a presentation to Board of Trustees at that point in time uh, about the issue and described riverine migration. And it was that recommendation to not uh, proceed with stabilization in 2018. In 2021, the district received additional stakeholder input, and um, there was a direction from the board to prepare RFP. The request to prepare the RFP occurred in February of this year, 2022, and then the board approved the RFP um, in April of this year. So the results that you're going to see here are from that proposal next slide. The proposal covered three main components. The first one is just a complete data gathering of all the issues, the history of the land use, the recreational um, interests, the riverine forces that are taking place. Uh, and then also, of course, we're very interested in the ecology of the area. Another major component of this request was to um, reach out and have stakeholder engagement to uh, see what the interests are and really frame this public issue in order to make um, the best decision for the public trust. We provided each organization uh, direction for uh, taking a look at feasibility of different conditions and any encumbrances to that restorative state. The, the dates are necessarily, hey, it has to look like this in 1939, it has to look like this in 2014. But really, if you remember that image where we compared the different lines, having that type of wetland to water ratio. Okay, so that's really what we're asking for in the restorative concepts. And then the third one of uh, the feasibility encumbrances is no action and having an assessment or a prediction on what a no action approach would look like. <clears throat> so the district received three proposals and uh, the <coughs> Land Preservation Natural Resources Division uh, review team felt comfortable with all of the proposals. Each one of the agencies that provided a proposal were determined to be qualified and we'd, we'd be comfortable working with any of the agencies. The first proposal to discuss was from B3 companies and they did, uh, they followed the feasibility right in order. So the, the first bullet here, the first task is that, that data collection component, gathering all the information the second one is the stakeholder engagement. And the third bullet is the feasibility study aspect of the project. And um, that came in at 
637 for the cost of those activities. And in comparing these three proposals, it's important to, next slide. Um, in 3C, B, B3, his opinion was that they didn't believe that the cost of modeling mm -hmm. uh, the ropes and forces was worth the benefit or, or the cost, what I would review that as being, um, and that they would be relying on engineering and best professional judgment based on past experience. Next slide. And this organization does have very applicable uh, past experience. These are two uh, projects that they have worked on in the Fox River area. Uh, the first one is the Pape Island shoreline stabilization, which is right here. So they did approximately 2,000 feet of shoreline stabilization. Uh, they were the principal lead on that one. And then uh, just upstream of the Algonquin Dam is the Stratton Locking Dam, and that's the one that regulates the pool for the chain. And they were the principal construction management firm for those upgrades. So they have very familiar um, experience in the local area. Next slide. The second proposal was from GCA Geoenvironmental. And uh, if you're looking through this in the board packet, you may have thought, well, where's the stakeholder engagement? And it is in there. They just incorporated as part of the other tasks. So they, they broke it up into two tasks. Each one of these groups did things differently, which is what you want to see in RFP, their unique approach. But GCA, I, I believe it was in 2.2 where they have the stakeholder engagement. So the first part is primarily their their data gathering, taking a look at all the, the hydraulics and um, completely assessing the issue. And then the, the second part of their proposal was uh, drafting that feasibility report. And GZA is also a very qualified company. And this is a pretty cool project that I enjoyed reading about where they are doing both hard and soft stabilization techniques. That's one thing I'm sorry, I neglected to mention. GZA also came up with a fourth alternative, which would be combining uh, some of the stabilization efforts. And they were proposing taking a look at hard scaping and soft scaping, so a combination of activities to, to stabilize the area. And it's very similar to this type of project. You can see right here, this is these are fetch. So this is your I see not fetch, but your wave pipe. So the impact, the ropes and forces from the waves, you can see they installed a, a rock barrier to knock some of that force down. And then they backed it up with uh, your, your more soft stabilization efforts, your, your green, if you will, stabilization effort. So very cool uh, project. And they certainly would be qualified to do this work. Next slide. The final company was Hay and Associates. And, um, they provided uh, what I would just call a stepwise and a la carte approach, where one through six is their proposed progression of activities. And one through five, I would say, would just be options for the board to consider, uh, depending on how we would like to proceed. So these are animations. Yeah, there we go. The first two, if you read right down here, it says task three will be necessary if any of tasks four through, four through six are selected. So once we get down to four through six, you have to add this $6,900 service. Now it says tasks four through six may not be required if tasks one through two provide adequate support at this time. So once we go through the process of data gathering and uh, facilitating that stakeholder discussions, pain associates proposing, that they could provide concept plans and cost opinions at these first two steps for 17,340. Next one. And then the review team thought that that modeling, uh, that predictive state would be important for uh, the board to consider, to understand what a no approach would be. So we thought that it would be appropriate to add uh, three and four, because again, four is that uh, modeling assessment of the erosive forces to know um, what a predicted state would be. And the total for that is 38,060. And Hay Associates is, next slide, Hay Associates has also determined, we've determined them to be qualified. They've done projects in uh, Lake Michigan, 
shorelines. This one here on the right is riverine and bluff stabilization repairs. And this is the shoreline part. And then this is the ravine on Lake Michigan. And then they also were the principal for Nipper Sink Watershed Engineering and 319 grant. This is just a table uh, to illustrate the comparisons between the companies. The district's review team recommendation is to uh, move forward with the Hay and Associates plan at a cost of $38,065, uh, including the modeling and in comparison to the B3 plan, which is pretty close, but a little bit less. Again, that didn't have the modeling, and the assumption there would be that would cost even more. Again, they were relying on engineering and judgment, but this was the one that was determined to be the most uh, economically efficient by uh, staff review. So with that, Ed and I can uh, take any questions that you have. The next slide is just the references that uh, I used for this presentation. If anyone wants to go back and take a look at some of the communication that took place with Dr. Is the Fox Waterway Agency a government agency? Is it an amalgamation of various uh, private and public interests? I believe it's the management. Yeah, I believe it is a government agency. No, I, I, I don't know. It is just almost like a special district. I, I, I don't know if they're a private corporation. I don't think they're a unit of government, but they end up with. Um, there's members that are appointed to their board, and, and uh, so we should find that out. They're listed on the stakeholder group, so we certainly would be investigating that sure. relationship. Is this a question? Yeah. They're, they're, so they're, they're, not tax, they're not tax, they, they can't tax or anything like that. They have to uh, rely on sticker sales for boat sales and grants from the state of Illinois. Okay. Thank you. In the feasibility study, is is there a, you know, walk through all the data, but the end game is to say, here's how we would go about repairing it, and here's what the cost would be projected to be. That would that be the goal, right? And there would be a minimum of of three options. The the no the no action option is is almost always in studies because it's almost your baseline. What will happen if you don't institute any type of change? Um, and then we we required at least two others, and Kate mentioned that using the 1939 and the, and the 2014 as baselines. That doesn't limit the, the companies from adding options if they find one along the way that they think is better. Or we work with the stakeholder engagement component, there may be other alternatives out there. Yes, sir. Uh, I, all the RFPs are so detailed and um, I mean, I, I can see any one of them doing any work. I've had experience with Dane Associates. I think uh, they've always been um, detail oriented, always foreseen. I think things that maybe aren't there. Well, my question is, is that um, just because I, I can't tell from the proposals necessarily of uh, any of these three companies that maybe have the majority of experience on the water on the mm -hmm. box, particularly that that, that levels it as well. Is any three of those that you would say? Yeah, yeah. Based on the resumes, it seemed like the V3 has the most okay experience in that area. They had that Cape Island and then the Stratton work. Right. So so again, when I was going through that, the uh, their professional judgment is is valuable because sure. of because of their experience. I wasn't trying to discount no. them. But that was like the dam work, though. Maybe. Dam, and the, but the Pape Island is really uh, stabilization. So like okay, all right. right. It's upstream. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't call it equivalent. Yeah. I just know Hay has done a lot of stabilization. The, the modeling we felt was very important because, regardless of the decision that is, is made with whatever options are presented, mm -hmm. um, it's based then on, on a good predictive model of what will happen if if stabilization is instituted or not instituted. And we felt that that allowed the board to have a foundation for making those kinds of decisions. Um, that's not to discount B3's engineering judgment. It's very good. Right. Okay, thank you. So, I, I just wanted to mention that 
I talked to Joe Keller last month about the uh, uh, he's the executive director at the Waterway Agency, and he his input was that if any if you guys need any help at all from because they they've worked on a river for how many years now? They built islands, uh, replaced islands. They re, uh, they used geotubes, which would be a song mm -hmm. um, backup, and uh, they do they're, they're they're doing rock. Uh, Installation around Prince Island right now, I believe, which is just south of Rock 12. But they've worked on the river, and he mentioned that any help grants or whatever he can help with, they would be happy to, to if you help you help uh, you guys out to take care of the problem. Well, I think we'll need all the help we can get <laughs> in one of these uh, proposals. I think a cost of several million dollars was. It's floated as uh, a starting point for something like this. Um, I have a question. Does the overall management of the river, is there coordination between the Algonquin Dam and the McHenry Dam? Is there, I mean, is there some, um, obviously if you let water, yeah. the pool size is gonna depend both on the outflow and the inflow. Right, yeah, they look at all that, the flood stages. USGA, USGS, excuse me, um, to, to try and figure out the best way to plug and fill. So that's coordinated through the state. Well, you also have to remember that Elgin uses the water for drinking water. So they, got, they have to have so much water coming through all the time. It, it's a particularly difficult river in that section um, to be able to accommodate all the various uses that, that have, a, have a take on the river. It's an important recreational area, not just in the chain, but just below it as well. And as you just heard, there's drinking water that's drawn from it. It's an important ecological river as well. So um, it's a tough call sometimes balancing all of those different things. And we know that the watershed in general is receiving more rainfall on harder surfaces than it had 50 years ago. And that those rainfall events are increasing uh, not only in number, but also in intensity. So uh, managing a river going forward is going to be a pretty tough problem. One, one other thing that the water agency is doing is they're working in a uh, watershed area encompassing different, different municipalities on the river um, to uh, create um, cleaner water and less water coming in and how to manage it. And that sort of works through each municipality is going to have to be a stakeholder in, in, in this watershed area. And Strong. I don't have a picture with me of the whole watershed area, but it's quite extensive. Bill, just to kind of give you an idea of how complex it can get, um, Nipperson Creek is a tributary to the chain, and then the district's uh, Nipperson Creek restoration projects alone, the two that we've accomplished over the past 25 years, holds literally tens of millions of gallons of flood water back in the chain. So that approach of working not just on the river, but in the tributaries that flow into it is really the long-term solution. But this specific issue is more the channel and embankments and trying to get silt to deposit where you want it and allow Recreational floating, where you also. Um, there are, seems to be a lot of players here uh, municipal, county, another county, uh, state. Um, I mean, I think it's a worthwhile uh, project, but I have no experience in sort of the coordination between all of these players, and then the issue of uh, cost sharing and so forth. Um, that's, this is probably premature to get too far ahead of the basic looking at engineering options. Um, but I guess I'm asking for people who have been through a project that encompassed you know, several years and multiple agencies, when do you start to Get other people sitting around the table so that uh, um, you know you don't go too far into a direction and then have you know someone raise an objection that uh, stops the whole 
Awesome. So I'm looking at that, but well, I can answer one of, the, yeah. well, one of the thoughts is the key piece to start in the districts, you know, being that the area that is adversely being impacted is district land. So at least the initial any any solution, mm -hmm. I think it, it behooves us as an agency to do the feasibility study that be our study, our consultant who's providing their opinion to us. And the stakeholders that are going to be met with as part of the process and those modeling of options, I think once their recommendation as the expert comes forth, then I still think there's another part before you actually get into construction and moving forward with the particular scenario where there may be another entity out there that wants to do their own study and pay for it and look at that. I mean, again, I think it's really important that um, we get our, through a solid source of Opinions and, and there's always going to be multiple opinions. Hopefully, with the consultants, they arrive somewhat at the same conclusion. But I think it's a three in our situation here, it's at least three tiered. The first is we don't have the in house capacity for this kind of engineering, and we talked about that earlier in the year. Um, the consultants would put forward a plan that would either be feasible or not feasible, and they would give us options that would come back to the board, assuming the feasible ones. The board at that time would discuss it and determine, yes, go forward, don't go forward. And that would be the point at which we would have a workable plan and a cost estimate where we would begin to shape the trees for partners and for money to do the, the project. Uh, and I think it's easier to do that when you have something in hand and you meet with agencies and organizations and donors and say, this is our cost estimate and what our, our deliverables, deliverables would be for the project. So we're uh, about two steps. At least one step, probably two, before we get to that. Let me ask the other members of the board if they have any comments or questions. And then the public, did you have I would just like to say, Elizabeth was correct because when I started, when we, Tom and I started digging into this, I first was approached the IDNR, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Waterway Agency. And everyone told me they couldn't do a thing. It was conservation, the McHenry Conservation District property, and they have to be the ones that decide what's going to happen. Thank you. All right. Well, I think and I'd like to say in another month. Our feeling was that the plan should incorporate restoration of the peninsula and the property that is eroded, and then uh, protection of that. And I, I understand, you know, what you're talking about with the dam and the erosion for that. But has anybody looked into the boat traffic and what it has caused? Because that, that was that would be part of what this feasibility study would. It would look at not only meeting with stakeholders like you are here, but also determining what impacts it had been responsible for, what percentage of that erosion, and how it could. If it was rebuilt, how can you prevent that from? I know being a landowner on the lower river for 38 years is that we started seeing the massive erosion occurring when the wakeboard boat became popular. And to this day, they're still causing so much erosion along the river. It's ridiculous. But, you know. You can't really take them off the waterway because there's no rules saying that they can't be out there. So that's where we were thinking that uh, if the district could restore areas that have been eroded already and then put in shoreline protection, that would help, even though the Wake Forest folks are still going to be causing some issues. Well, I wouldn't even care if they restore. I just want the erosion to stop from what's there now. I don't know what their plan and your your engineering plan. They're the ones making the decision on that. I think I just want all the erosion to stop because it's it's the waterway agency is spending thousands and thousands of dollars up on the north end of the river to dredge and, and keep we call it Wisconsin topsoil coming into the river. And to keep that, it's costing the agency thousands and thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of dollars actually to keep the river as clear as they can. And 
here we're letting all this sediment come down off this erosion and it's it's right just south of there i can i like i mentioned a couple times i can watch a, a heron out there standing in the water and i can watch the toenail you know well we certainly appreciate the, um, the light that you sort of shown on this and your activism to uh, you know come and speak before us uh, obviously this is a complex problem and, and we're not going to make anybody happy uh, but I think we're uh, going to try to do the right thing and start in the direction of improving the watershed and hopefully Oh yes, right. Whether it occurs in your lifetime or my lifetime, or I don't think grandchildren's lifetime—that's another issue. But uh, uh, we'll see. All right. So the, I think the board is going to vote on the staff's recommendation uh, next Tuesday. We have a chance to read that, and Kate, that was a wonderful presentation. And you know, if we wish to direct questions that you were had, we will. And, Maybe we'll read that proposal with better understanding now, and we'll be prepared to uh, vote on the firm selection and the initial political uh, uh, cost. I understand the one question. I understand one of the major goals is to stop the erosion, you know, the primary, but would it also not be to restore wetland in the, in the areas? Yeah, they would say it's submerged now, and if we can stop that. We would gain more wetland as well. It's, it's, still, it's, still, it's currently waters of the United States, so it would be just a more wetland approach. So, wetland engineering uh, would be a component to of any type of restoration, uh, in my understanding. All right. Well, then, uh, thank you all. And we're going to move on to 5.2, uh, which is a amendment of the School Springs Mitigation Banking Instrument, also known as MDI, in the Aspers. And I, I bet Val's going to take this. No, no I don't know. think. Who's going to take this? I think Ron, I'm, I'm back on. Uh, the, the board approved our mitigation banking documents in 2021. We've been operating under those ever since. Um, and recently, and I explained this in the board summary, we had a credit request that was actually involving waters. And remember that when we say waters in the United States, we're talking about wetlands basically, um, that was outside of McHenry County. And our initial banking instrument defined the impacts that we were going to take as being um, in waters of the United States or within isolated waters in Henry County. We consulted with the Corps. They said the sale was fine based on our bank and the board passed that and we brought forward with that sale. But the staff feels that we should make a minor change to the MBI to make sure there's no confusion about where we can take credit from. And so you have before you that slight change, which is uh, basically a wording change that defines isolated waters is not just within McHenry County, but within the upper Mississippi watershed. So the difference between isolated and waters of the United States is waters of the United States are administered by the Army Corps of Engineers and isolated waters in McHenry County anyway are administered through our county stormwater ordinance. We will still be able to take isolated water impacts from our own county, but if we do wind up with one from outside the county, this more clearly defines that it's fine for us to go ahead and handle the impact. This would then move to the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure they would approve the change once they approved it. Any uh, uh, yeah, I think we're going to vote on this uh, on Tuesday also. So thank you. Now, 5.3 the fabulous fox, the water trail. I think that is, no, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I'll start, and then um, so we had received a letter from uh, the group called the Fabulous Fox. 
came with the National Park Service to identify a water trail along the box uh, from one county all the way up through Wisconsin. Um, you can see here exactly from actually LaSalle down even past Kane Kendall um, and to build this thing all along to, to make it an amenity uh, for not only access and to the river, its natural resource quality and but also recreation. Um, one of the designations of something like this is one of the key player in ecotourism uh, for the area. It also assists in grant opportunities that would come about knowing that uh, you're part of a larger system, bigger part of the whole. Similar when uh, Chicago Wilderness is doing a regional approach to activities or even our local Hackentack National Wildlife Refuge that pulled in Wisconsin and uh, Illinois to work together towards land preservation. And so having that type of distinction in the area, I think their efforts have been well received and they're getting great traction to which hopefully they will have designation by MPS uh, by uh, the summer of June of 2023. Um, they're asked though- MPS is? National Park Service. Oh, okay. National okay. Park Service, yeah. Okay. So the, um, their ask of us is to include two of our sites, one that uh, we've got both of them on the box have access to river, one being the um, Fox Bluff uh, Conservation Area and the other one, the Hickory Riverfront, Hickory Grove Riverfront. Um, we do not promote those as active paddling areas uh, from the district, but we do know their use and their access points to the water. Um, so it was brought forward a uh, discussion with uh, our staff here at the district of inclusion and the one piece we just wanted to make sure, and I did follow up with Karen Miller, who was one of the co-chairs, that there are no standards or expectations of improvements that need to be made to the site for it to be included. You're going to have soup to nuts along the different properties that they have selected um, to promote. Basically what they're doing is a communication strategy on their website of the different access areas and what amenities are available at those particular sites. Um, so with the ask and, and what we have brought forward is we could uh, be agreeable to be included as part of this. Obviously any future development on those sites that we would have would be positively influenced being part of this larger picture. Um, but we have no plans immediately to make any modified uh, public access improvements to those areas. Um, what Karen did share with me is one is just that we would give permission for someone to be able to get to the water, right? So they would have the ability to do so. And then second, um, they have parking on the areas and both sites do meet those criteria. So in front of you, um, you have a resolution and a letter which is redrafted this afternoon, making these two clarifications after my conversation with um, Karen Miller. Um, John, from your team, and I mean, you guys have talked you through a plan. Any other thoughts that you have? Um, no, the, this is, the sites are very primitive. Um, and when there were some photographs in there that we, we put in there. Uh, and as long as we're managing people's expectations that are floating down the river, that you know they're not going to come to, you know, someone looking their canoe out for them. Uh, they're, they're pretty primitive. I, um, for me, they're they're fine, but I've I've been told that you know when I go adventuring in, in the wilds, told by my wife, I'm odd in that um, I I don't mind being a little uncomfortable. For me, those are fine. But uh, for other people, it might be a different expectation. So we just wanted to make sure that we were not going to be disappointing people with it. So um, that's the only the only concern we had was that. And I think when uh, Luther has clarified. And these are just some pictures that were in your board packet of what we're talking about primitive. I mean, so it's a shoreline you can access there. And of course, they, um, they don't go all the way and they're not ADA accessible or anything else like that, but they're existing conditions. Are there restrooms for them? 100 yards of the water or 200 yards or a quarter mile? Or quarter mile. Quarter mile. <laughs> Running water or uh, uh, in, uh, I believe in both cases, yes. Any questions from the board members? The, the one map that has, there's an exclamation mark by the, they had Algonquin Dam on the map. Is there a significance to that? 
Um, probably a warning warning. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get too close to the thing. over. Yeah. Danger. 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 Approve this most likely. It's on the agenda for two years. Yes, yes. So, 5.4 is uh, an energy bid and it's an electrical service update. Jen, you want to take this sure. one? Um, for the trustees that were seated at the time in, in February, uh, I think we brought this forward as a, uh, a poll. Or I think it might have been April or in there about typically the district bids its energy, and I mean energy, I mean electricity, bids it in the in between the heating season and the cooling season. So that March, April time frame. Uh, that's typically when the uh, cost of electricity is the lowest. Uh, so we would bid for a year at that time. And we were prepared to do that. Um, the consultant was you know, gearing up to do that. And you all remember what happened in Europe at that time. Uh, and it took energy prices and just skyrocketed them. Uh, and we were fortunate that our um, our next year of service doesn't begin, or I, I'm sorry, we're under contract currently until December. So uh, that's when the consultant said, let's just hold on this. So that was the recommendation until things settle down. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings with a consultant in the last two months, uh, and he indicated that things were settling down. They were surprised that things were dropping. You can see the same thing at the pump. I mean, the gas prices are coming down a little bit. Uh, he's also seen the drop of energy prices, uh, electricity, and things like that. So what, what we're bringing forth is uh, uh, it, it's an odd one in that these are commodities, and that is the price is set in the morning. Okay. We have to sign a contract that day for that year. Okay. So, what we're seeking is for you to authorize staff to go ahead and sign that contract, that bid basically. And then we bring it back to you to ratify, to you know, approve at a later time. The reason we want to do that this time is we want to take advantage. We want to be fluid about this or have a flexibility so that when the consultant says, all right, I think it's where it's, it's, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be low here, let's, let's take advantage of it, that we can move on, a, you know, on or done on that. So the request is that you are authorizing Elizabeth or her designee to go ahead and, and sign the bid document to you know, basically enter a contract, and then we will bring it back to ratify. Um, just for, for, for uh, so you know the scope of this, we have the option just to go with comment, but in the years past, we've saved about seven to $12,000 a year by going this route. Um, when we discovered it a number of years ago, we were like, okay, that's, you know, that's worth it. Let's, let's do that. So uh, that's what we're looking for um, on Tuesday. Questions? Who are we with now? Constellation. Uh, it's Constellation. I can't remember. It has another second yeah. acronym to the federal ordinance. And, and I do want to clarify, ComEd still builds us. There are certain sites that this bid does not extend to only has to be only the ones that have enough value to interest these you know firms these entities so that's why you still see a bill from comment any other questions well, we'll forward on this resolution on Tuesday thanks thanks all right um so next is a review of the regular meeting agenda items for next week. And we of course discuss some of them on this evening. And uh, does the board have any issues with, with, with what is on the consent agenda for next week that you want to see pulled or amended? All right, well then we'll leave it as it stands. Um, 
So we had our workshop about the uh, fiscal year uh, 2024 uh, budget. I think it was uh, um, very helpful uh, to me. Um, sure, we've all slept on this and uh, <laughs> worried about it, and uh, I've been able to discuss it with uh, uh, with the majority of the board. I have a general sense of where the consensus is headed. Um, but I want to allow time for every board member to uh, review it. So we're not quite ready to give the, uh, I can, what I'm going to do is tell Andy which direction the wind is blowing. And then on Tuesday, I'll tell him uh, about the consensus. So I think uh, we're in favor of taking the 2022 PCL levy. We're in favor of the 7% non-personnel cost increase. We're in favor of the proposed capital spending of 560,000. And we recognize that there will be an additional uh, carryover from what was unspent. We're comfortable with that. And we're okay with the reserve spending of 772,000. Well, that's the that's an update on the, on the consensus. Um, I don't think it will change between now and Tuesday. The employee wage uh, cost increases. Whenever you have options, then that you know creates a, a controversy, but it gives you something to think about. Um, and obviously. We were able to show a slide that showed that for several years, uh, wage costs were keeping track, keeping pace with inflation. And then a couple of years, we've fallen behind. And uh, the cost of inflation is, is uh, not a sure thing, but it perhaps is starting to turn around. Um, I think we're moving uh, towards a consensus on the 6%. Uh, scenario, and uh, I think we'll have that finalized by Tuesday. Does anyone want to add anything to that? We we're going to find out on um, what the wage and whether or not it included any benefits, or if that was a separate. Um, yes, I. Um, and he explained to me how that works. So if we start out with a 6% uh, figure for employee wage costs, that actually translates into a 7.3% increase in the budgeted costs. The majority of that, in, that additional increase relates to the 4-7 wage Policy. The longer you're employed, you get moved up in, in your what you're reimbursed. Um, that was, I think, 1.1% of the difference between 6% and 7.3. And Andy can explain what the other 0.2 tenths of a percent is. Uh, the two tenths are promotions um, and some other wage increases that were given during the fiscal year the one in budget. Yeah. So they weren't in the current budget 23, so as you incorporate those dollars, real costs are 24 of us. Roll up costs, though, for benefits, Social Security, unemployment insurance, all that, which, which levers up. That's in a separate line item in the budget. Absolutely. We, we did show that when we did the presentation. We saw those first of all costs going up just a little bit because we figured that we'll health insurance costs coming down. I don't know if it's our cost coming down 20%. Okay. Um, yeah. So on Tuesday, we'll give you the actual consensus, but I think we're toning in on this. Coming up with an agreement. Okay. Elizabeth, then 6.0 is the executive director. Yeah, I'm going to give my report because I'm going on vacation. So I will be here next week. 
and just a lot of great things. I do appreciate the board coming out and taking the extra time for the financial planning workshop. I think it was great uh, conversation, the work that's being done to kind of make some of those critical decisions and the work that's going to go forward. Um, I've been talking with President Cook and identifying um, how the working groups are going to roll out. And so for those, um, and I'll let him, I will take your thunder, Bill, of who's going to be on the group. But um, for those that are going to step into that, I will be sending out uh, just a scheduling Google and figuring out what best is going to work as far as meeting times, um, via Zoom or in person or however we want to work through that and kind of our goal would be to start to meet through September, October to really finalize all of that and then bring it back so when we're together for our November workshop meeting, we, we have that information. So I'll be sending that out. So I'll comment that Lloyd and Chris have volunteered to be on this um, working group and to work with the staff on this question of uh, finance and options for the world. And then once we have that back in November, then we'll have another working group that will start where there'll be two additional other trustees. Um, and that's not to say that the, the one group that was started will not, it's just going to go back and forth. One group will get started, the other group will then start, and there'll be some work by both working groups as we go throughout the year. So I'll be giving that out to you. Um, the district, uh, a lot of, a lot of press and activities. So the new landscapes is out. It looks great. We submitted um information uh Wendy and team with Brenna and Brad they've been appearing on an IAPD Illinois Association of Park Districts uh their IAPD park park cast that they have and a nice feature on the bison that we have at Pleasant Valley uh that we can show when we were there but they are there <laughs> um there was also when we put together to <laughs> and uh Brenna uh they wrote an article which is featured in your PR magazine. So if you get this, take a look at this. But we've got a nice spread here on the, the great projects. So I was getting a lot of promo. Um, and then uh, they submitted a, an award application to the IEPD's best of the best. I think that a lot of cover was hopefully, you know, all odds will go with the great. Um, also the conservation district with nationally McKinley County, there was a great article that was uh, presented in the back about the rebranding and the importance of the outdoors. And so if you get the Northwest uh, quarterly, we the back of the article, but really pushing out for the visitor economy, as well as uh, being featured um, in the Illinois uh, magazine for uh, tourism. So again, we're starting to see a lot of activity. It's really picking up good traction. Which is which is great to see. Um, let's see here. The other thing for board, just as a reminder, um, the no before you go, cybersecurity, those are mandated. So we do need to have you take those two courses. Uh, if you're having difficulty getting in, please reach out. We'll make sure that we get you signed up and, and get you through that. Um, we're also um, the CAG. Uh, is having, I sent out, uh, if anyone's interested in playing golf, um, I didn't get one volunteer, um, anybody else that would be interested, I don't know that we would have a foursome, but if there is interest, I just need to let Christy know uh, in my absence and, and we can get you registered for that because that'll be at the end of the month, I believe. Uh, what do you have? 29th. 29th. So I don't know if we have any other golfers here. In the natural areas. I have a lot of bad habits, but golf's not one. We do have a, we do have a, a, a person that's willing. So if you want to play, we're we'll going to mix up with some of the other municipalities. So um, we're happy to, to do that. Mark Twain called it a good walk ruin. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see here. We also sent out, uh, we did get word, uh, the chairman had shared with me, uh, Arnold, you entered West, a request. Uh, for a permit variation on air pollution. And so um, we did, I sent that out earlier to so check at that, but uh, did correspond back and we'll continue to reach out with them and the work that's being done separate from our issue with the groundwater, but still an issue with that, that uh, we're still trying to, to get awareness and to get a resolution on, on where that sits um, for, uh, it's been going on for quite some time and um, hopefully we'll get some traction um, with that. Uh, and then the last thing, I do want to congratulate our accounting team, Andy Dialect, and uh, the team and everybody else, the board included, that were involved. Uh, the budget received the budget presentation on Distinction Award. This is the third year of the applied and we received it every year. So. 
That's bad, and I sent you information that seems very well and long. So, oh, well, I don't think right now. Let's see when I get back. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, John's got the first leg, then Ed's got it, and then you'll have plenty. Is it like a pager that you pass along? Yeah. I don't know how they're going to do it, but it's as quickly as you can. It's, it's like hot potato. The football. Yeah, that's all right. I have. I'm going to go into executive session, but now do we need to vote to close this session? We need a vote to, we need a vote to go into executive session. We have public comment. I would just like to say thanks for listening. Well, us putting our two cents in. I hope it gets started in my lifetime. I doubt if it's going to finish in my lifetime, but if, if I see it started, I'll be happy as hell. Thank you. We appreciate your taking it off. Any other comments from the public or staff? Great. See a couple of foundation members here. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Okay, then. Uh, Motion to go into the executive motion. I'll second. The second. Senator Fritz? Yes. Vice President Dom? Yes. Secretary Thomas? Yes. Trustee Zimmerman? And President Cook? Yes. I can't write everything down. Can we do that action out of executive session anticipated? So we will be back. And we are back into. Reconvene roll call. Okay. All right. So I think uh, I've asked Sean to uh, make the motion. It's comfortable. You have to do a roll call. Oh, no, no. Oh, 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 Okay, Secretary Thomas. Yes. Senator Fritz? Yes. Trustee Everard? Yes. Vice President Dom? Yes. Trustee Zimmerman? Yes. President Cook? Yes. I'm going to make a motion uh, in consideration to pass Ordinance 22 1018, an ordinance authorizing the execution of real estate purchase and gifts agreement and the acquisition of real. Property commonly known as the Hewer Purchase Parcel, the Hewer Gift Parcel, pursuant to the terms of said agreement. Second. Second. I'm sorry, who's seconding? All right. Why? You? Roll call? Yes. Okay, Secretary Thomas. Yes. Trustee Zimmerman? Yes. Treasurer Prince? Yes. Trustee Everard? Yes. Vice President Dom? Yes. President Cook? Yes. Thanks for all that work. Yeah, get that out. I think we can have a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion to adjourn. I'll second that. Trustee uh, Everard? Yes. Vice President Dom? Yes. Secretary Thomas? Yes. Trustee Zimmerman? Yes. Senator Prince? Yes. President Cook? Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. You bought your first piece of land. Good night, everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah.